These testimonials are representative of my or our experiences, but the exact results and experience will be unique and individual to each person. The information provided herein is not medical advice and is not intended to substitute for the advice of your personal physician or other healthcare providers. Welcome to The Beautiful Bag. This is your host, Leanne Hayden, cancer survivor, and more importantly, ostomy lifer. Each and every week, I'm going to be bringing a special guest or some inspiration for you and a few little stories along the way so that you can learn what life is like for us to be living in an ostomy and why we all think it's a beautiful bag. So listen in and let's get started. I am your host, Leanne Hayden, and this week I have a new member of my family, <laughs> the Austin <Austin> family, <laughs> at least my world, um, Stephanie Brenner. She and I, her and I met at the Austin, the UOAA convention. Well, it depends on when you're listening to this. For us, it was last week, but <laughs> it might be a few weeks from now. But so we met at that convention um, and just her story needs to be told. And just like I always say to all you guys, your stories are very, very important. They inspire others. And, um, and she's got a great one. So Stephanie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Leanne. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad that we connected. I'm so glad we connected there. So we were just chatting a little while ago and Stephanie was filling me in on her, you know, on her journey, how she's had three surgeries and, you know, now, I mean, with her, her life now is a career as a therapist with people with chronic illnesses and all the things. So I'm not going to take her thunder, but Stephanie, why don't you, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, just what we just talked about those three surgeries, like, you know, from when you started in 2001 and, and ended with an permanent in 2018. Yes, totally. Well, I'm honored to be here. I love talking with other ostomates. I love your podcast. I love just anything that decreases stigma in the world because there's so much. Um, So I was kind of a normally developing kiddo, didn't have any GI issues until um, the end of high school. And it came on with a vengeance and got diagnosed with UC within the first week. so that was nice that I got a, a quick diagnosis. They tried all the meds that they could throw at me. And um, at the time there weren't that many options besides steroids um, and Remicade. And they said within that year, they were like, you need a J pouch. So we did the three-step surgery, um, subtotal colectomy with the diverting loop. And uh, then Eight months later, they um, made the J pouch. And then a couple months later, they closed the ostomy. So that was my first experience with the stoma. It was a trip. I was in college. So I just like was not making the best choices. I just wanted to be left alone and do whatever I want. But I made it through and I was happy to kind of be pooping normally again and not having to deal with it. Um how and... was that? Let's let's talk about that for a second because there's yeah, a lot of sure. people here that talk about like, you know, I was in college or I'm in high school or, you know, yeah. how how were those years? Like what what were some of the things that you you're like, I wanted to be left alone, I just wanted to live normal. What yeah. was that like? I I mean, my doctors at one point were like, You're not allowed to go away for school. And I was like, mm, well, I'm actually gonna live abroad for a year and do a gap year like they do in Europe. So I'm going to go, but put me on whatever meds you want, but like, you're going to be mad. Like, and somehow my parents let me and then, then, and for some reason, of course, those six months in Europe, um, eventually I ran out of money backpacking, but those six months were fine. And then I got home and I was like, I got to pick a college. Cause I was going to be gone a year and it's the middle of the year. And I remember my doctors being like, don't go away to school. You need to stay within the state so that we can see you. And, you know, you might have worse flares. I was like, no, I mean, I'm a youngest child. Like, no, I'm a risk taker. No, thanks. Um, So I moved four hours away. I felt like that was like a compromise, but I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to let this dictate my life. And then at school, I was just, you know, like a typical 
teenager wanting to just explore uh, my body, drinking, recreational drug. Like I just did not care. To, this was like such a nuisance. Um, I learned to manage it well. And I luckily, like I had, had some like nursing students in my sorority that I would like <laughs> teach them things about the human body. Like I made the best of it. Um, I had these big prednisone cheeks. So everyone would ask me if I got my wisdom teeth out, you know, so there were, there were things where there were definitely medications I was on. I should not have been drinking. I just was not making wise choices, but I also was like, everyone, this is like college. This is the time where I should get to do the fun thing. So I still, I feel like I made the, the most of it, but it was still quite a, I don't know, a quite, quite an adventure. And I'm sure my doctors or parents, loved ones were probably shaking their head a little bit. Probably, probably. But you know what I love that you said, you, you weren't going to let this stop you. You were young, you wanted yeah. to live your life. You figured it out. Like I'm not yeah. staying home. I'm going away to college. I'm yeah. you know, on some meds. I'm going backpacking. I think that's that mindset that you have mm -hmm. intuitively helped you get through it faster yeah. like, or get yeah. through it, not faster, but just to get through right. it right? and to be able to, right. live because that's, you know, you would just said a little while ago, you know, while we were talking prior, it's like, you know, we have this one life, right? Like this is it, yeah. like, right? We're in this one path. Right. So that was the first, that was, so that was your first experience with an ostomy. The first one. Yeah. yeah. And now you're in a J pouch. Life is good. Right. right. Yep. I'm kind of like starting my twenties, figuring out my career and family and, um, J pouch never was great. It was always giving me pouchitis and different things, but I was like, eh, it's enough that I don't want to deal with any more meds, any more surgeries. Um, and so I was able to manage pretty well, um, started flaring up more and more. So they put me on Humira, which was the only kind of med at the time. Um, and then I started getting abscesses and fistulas. So that was the kicker where it was like, ooh, it was misdiagnosed, misdiagnosed. And then that's, they figured out that's what was going on. Um, thankfully my gynae at the time really was thorough. And so that really changed a lot in terms of diagnosis, knowing that perianal disease with abscesses or fistulas are signs of Crohn's. Um, it definitely was like a big pivot moment because I had celebrated every little, I'm very much into like celebrating every little thing. So I remember graduating myself and being cured um, after that third J pouch surgery back, at, you know, in college and saying goodbye to the nurses, and, you know, just feeling like I'm done. That weird GI chapter is over. And then for them to be like, actually, you've got Crohn's. I'd always said, at least I don't have Crohn's. Mm -hmm. Like I'm so grateful, which is <laughs> terrible. Um, so then I, then I had to wrap my head around, okay, I have the thing that I didn't want to have. And this little tiny thing is really wrecking a lot. They're trying all these different, you know, repairs and cetons and a flap advancement, all these procedures, nothing's working. And one option is the temporary ostomy. And I know, I know what that's like. I've done a bag. It's been, it had been 10 years, but like, sign me up. I was that, at that point, mentally, I was like, just give me a temporary diverting loop. I can do it. And maybe that'll just get this thing calmed down. Um, and it did, it did for actually quite a long time. Um, but eventually that, diverted J pouch that was just kind of dormant hanging out down there was just stricturing and spasming and it did not like even though the loop was really helping me give my quality of life back um that started acting up and so um I don't know I started to get like bowel obstruction just things where I was like ooh. Even with the ostomy, I'm having issues. Maybe we do need everyone. Had, all my doctors had said we need to get that thing out at some point, mm -hmm. uh, the J pouch. So, um, in 2017 is when I ended up having a very random 
um, pain, which turned out to be a liver abscess from Crohn's, which I had never had anything like that. And it ended in me in ICU, which at the time they had given me, I was like married after, one, it was like on our first anniversary and he, the doctor gave us, gave me like 50, 50 odds of surviving this. It was very sudden. It was in, I won't go into it, but it was so intense. Um, I was completely dissociated talking about shopping in Europe. I was, I was in a happy place on, you know, but I was, it was so painful. And so they said, as soon as you get kind of recovered from this day, um, of sepsis, we need to take that J pouch out. We need to do the Barbie, but the total APR, you know, take out your rectum and anus, take out that stricture J pouch. It's going to be a big surgery. You've been putting it off and it's time. So that was quite a year. That was January, 2018. Um, they actually kept the same stoma. So I still have Richard, as I call him, he's the loop. I don't love the loop. I must say, I really wanted, wanted it to end, but they were like, this surgery is already going to be like so many hours long. Like we're not, we're not fussing. We're, we're keeping your same stoma. We're taking the rectum, the anus, the struck, the stricture J pouch was like hours and hours of them getting it, like adhe adhesions, like to get it out. And then it was a lot. So that was my journey to the my final stoma, which I have now, um, it's 2018. So it's been, I don't know, six years. It feels like forever, but, um, really happy I did it. And then the year after my Barbie, but I also had, um, I know I mentioned this, but the, a breast cancer diagnosis. So I had a double mastectomy and, reconstruction so that was quite a journey too I feel like since knock on wood since the 2019 it's been like a pandemic but that was like no big deal because a, a, my health was not failing me like thank goodness this happened all before pandemic right? that would have been the icing on the cake that um, would have been crazy but here's you had said something yeah. earlier you know between 2018 and so now it's I lived through sepsis I finally have a permanent ostomy yeah. Like, this is it. You had said um, earlier, I finally felt good. Yeah. Yeah. It really was. It was amazing. The night, the night and day of after I got my Barbie, but I don't know. It was almost like my, <laughs> my body just was so ready for healing it had been just like having this, like, I view it as like this toxic, like strictured, like inflammation. So it was like right up next, it was causing like, um, not only spasms, but it was causing like bladder issues, gyne issue. It was like all of the area was just so inflamed around that J pouch that was dormant that it was like, as soon as it was out, like my wounds healed, like, so 50, 50, they had told me like, half of the people will need another surgery because it's so extensive. All this, I mean, it was basically from my belly button all the way down to where my anus was. So it was like such a huge wound and drains. You can't sit. And so I was kind of prepared. Like, even I was like told the doctor, even if it was like 99 and one, I would be the one, like, I'm always the weird outlier that they're like, bring in the residents. Look at this cool, you know, right. look at this medical marvel. One of my doctors calls me Miss Mystery because every time we think it's something, it's the opposite. It's nothing. And we think it's nothing. And she'll like, okay, I'll call you in a couple of days, but it's probably nothing. It's something. So it's just kind of like knowing it's really annoyingly complicated sometimes. And as soon as it got the J pouch out, it just calmed the heck down. Like my wounds healed pretty great. I didn't have to do another surgery to get it fussed with it. I don't know. It just really knock on wood. I've been able, I'm not on any medication. So that feels like a huge, huge gift. Um, for years and years, I was on Humira and I was getting every infection under the sun. Um, which again, there's more targeted biologics. Now there's options if I need them in the future. I have Crohn's, there's no guarantee. I'm not going to need that, but 
it's been so nice to have a quiet have room in my life to do all the non-medical things you know knock on some wood for that I'm knocking on my table no right right Right. I just feel like I have to celebrate every day knowing how bad it was and knowing man I probably should have done it a little sooner you know if I had known this is how it would look on the other side yep I should have traded in that quality of life but it was so so much anticipatory anxiety I was not ready So let me, let's talk about that, right? So it was so much anxiety. You weren't ready. What did you think it was going to be like? Like Mm. what was the hesitation? What did you think life was like? You already had a temporary, you had a temporary for a while. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I had, I know I had had it for like a good six years. So I kind of was like, I'm going to have either this stoma or something else. I think it was the big surgery is what I called it. Probably not the best. I just was thinking it's going to be this huge, terrible, insurmountable thing. What if I have complications and I'll just like take this quality of life. Like this, the stoma is good enough. Like I I can just have these spasms. They're only once every that, you know, like you start, you know, again, bargaining with yourself in order to not have to go under the knife because you know, you know, if you've been through three J pouch and a temperate, you know, Oh, a hospital stay. Like, I just don't have it in me right now. I can handle this. Like you start downplaying your quality of life. So I think it was for me, just the hurdle of getting through the surgery that I was like, I just don't want to do it. And oh, now I met my person and oh, now we're engaged. Oh, now we're planning a wedding. There's never a good time to be like, I'm going to do this, you know, commit to like taking a good, well, three months off for sepsis, another two for Barbie, but you know, like, it's it's inconvenient and so I was just like I'll push it off you know it'll it'll be fine so I think I needed I needed to talk to multiple surgeons I mean it was a privilege that I got to um have the decision you know it wasn't emergency surgery I didn't wake up from sepsis with you know you know that I could heal but I also like I I think I was just I couldn't even think about what my life would be after I just thought well it's such a big price to pay and there's no guarantees of the after. What if it's just as bad? So I'm not going to do it. I, I, I talked myself out of it. Right. And so you finally do it. You're like, Oh, I'm finally feeling good. And yeah. then yeah. Hi, here's breast cancer. Right. 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 Which I, I mean, in a weird way, I was mentally, prepared for that because I had known that I had a genetic mutation called BRCA2 and so they had been monitoring me because of my family history and then knowing that I have a mutation every three to six months for like a decade and I'd had a couple false alarms so I was like "Mm, they've always said it's not like if you get it it's when you get it but I just want to catch it early and luckily they caught it super early it still was annoying that they caught it at all and that it was, you know, it was 35, I think. So 36. So I still was really a lot younger than when my mom got it. Um, so it was still a surprise, but it was like, <sighs> I've done so much more. All my, my breast surgeons, when they see my um, medical history, my giant book, they're like, oh, this is a walk in the park. Drains, you've done drains. You know, this is a lot less. Yeah. So I felt like I was well prepared from the GI surgeries and from going through the the big surgery with the Barbie, but it just was another like sinking feeling of like, I just, I just want to fast forward. I don't want to have to do this. I know this is the only way is through. I have to just go through, but, um, I had lovely support. I had the most wonderful boob voyage party that my sister and friends planned that was all you know I had like a boudoir shoot with my old boobs before I lost Mm -hmm. them and um you know it's a really it's a very different process but there's also a lot of stigma too with women and their breasts and beauty so there's a lot a lot of like overlap and then a lot of differences because breast cancer was so mild for me whereas IBD was a lot more severe. Um, but that's, so it's been 
four years of just kind of doing my checks, checking in with all my doctors, making sure we're healthy and good. But overall, it's been a wild ride, but I'm so happy. I'm happy to be stable enough medically to be true, to be outpatient, Mm -hmm. like no more ICUs, no more pick lines, no more, um, I don't know, just all the paraphernalia. All I have to manage is my bag. Like, all I have to do is reorder supplies. That is a privilege and a treat. Like I can do that. And I get to talk with ostomates and other chronic illnesses, but every day I get to just do the career I wanted, you know, and like get to be a therapist and sit one-on-one with the, I worked in a hospital setting for a while. Now I'm in private practice. I have my own business. I have the flexibility and the free, I just feel like this is the life. Like if I knew this was on the other side, I would have done it years ago, but I met, there's no, I think I I had to create it once I felt better. And you had to, you had said it a little while ago, you had to go through it, right? There was no other way around any of this. You can't ignore it. We can't procrastinate it. We can't make it go away. We can't wish it, wish it away. We can't, we can't do any of the things we've got to actually physically, you have to go through it to get to that other side and, and you've done it and you did. And now you have this, you know, you've had, like you said, your ileostomy, it's just it, you know, it's, I just have my bag. I just have to change my bag. What a blessing is that, that you feel that way, because there's a lot of people that don't feel that way. There's a lot of people that have, we have, they have skin issues and they have other things like that. And you be a therapist. I want to dig into this because we did a lot of mental, there was a lot of um, body image um, when we were yes. at the convention and I know you ran the segment for mental health, right? Yeah. Mental yeah. Health. Let's talk about that because it's very, very important because there's so much, like you said, stigmas around it. Mm-hmm. What do you, what do you see most when you're talking with people when it comes yeah. to their mental health? What do you see the most? Um, okay. So the big, big three, I would say is, um, anxiety, depression, and then trauma. So medical PTSD, I could say I've definitely tasted those all as a patient myself. Um, And so those are the ones that I kind of assess everyone for. So anxiety could be um, what's going to happen in the future. How is this affecting my life now? Um, Social anxiety, it could be a whole manifest in a bunch of ways. Depression is kind of feels a lot like grief, like heavy, really hard to motivate, just feeling hopeless and helpless that my body's been altered in this way. And I have low self, you know, esteem or self-talk. And then the trauma piece is kind of getting more talked about now and studied more. And I just am fascinated by it because it's like not been researched a ton yet with IBD or with ostomates, but just the, um, the thought that something medical, which is like you're paying a doctor, you're trusting your life, you know, these are things that give us our lives back, these procedures, but they also at the same time they, that they give our life back, they can cause very real um, PTSD symptoms like flashbacks or hypervigilant or night terrors. Um, I still am working through a lot of my stuff from the ICU. So it's, the studies are more with people who have been hospitalized usually, or who have had a surgery again, have a higher prevalence. So it's just kind of teaching, normalizing that like you didn't cause this. And it's kind of confusing because some people just think of trauma as like a veteran or someone maybe who was raped or something like that. So I I like to normalize that like the trauma was from the doctor who actually helped heal you, but to heal you, he had to cut you open. And then you had all this. So I also like this one quote that's called like, uh, the body does not, cannot distinguish between the knife of an attacker and the knife of a surgeon. So it's just helping people realize that like, even though you knew cognitively, this is safe. I trust my surgeon. This is how I need, I need to go through this there still might be some residual like mistrust in your body or like sensations that are unwanted and you have to still work through feeling that. Um, It doesn't just go away. You might feel 
yeah. So I have a lot of, I can go on and on about that topic, but those are the three that I really like to touch on. Um, well, we can talk just about this a little more because sure. last week or a couple of weeks ago, um, I had a somatic coach. I saw that. Yeah. Somatic My coach. Somatic helps coach. People connect. Right? Yeah. So she helps people connect with their Beautiful. mind, their body like their body. How does your body feel? Like when I sit there and I'm talking to her from my own personal experience, like right now, I feel like I have this canister that's sitting right here, like in my upper abdomen, not even my lower, my Mm -hmm. upper abdomen. And it feels, she goes, and then she'll have you do this little like breathing exercise session. Like, what does it feel like? What does it look like? What's it trying to say to you? Like, where is it going? And then she has you walk through it. And I did this whole session with her. And then she's like, you know, I was like, it's, thick and little and brown and it's this and it's that and she goes I go it's here to it, it is so weird because I was doing this thing I'm like this is so woo wooey but it's just let me get it let me just say what's coming to my yeah mind. just like, let it free association like, whatever oh, inside right I'm like it's feeling like it's protecting me for some reason and I don't know why it's here and blah mm-hmm. right so then she had me just do this little exercise and then she goes okay how do you feel now I go Ooh, it went to my feet. Like it just, mm. it like opened and went to my feet. She goes, that means it's grounding. And that's mm. a good sign mm-hmm. because it released, mm-hmm. right? But then it grounded you. So she does yeah. a lot of somatic work, um, yeah. Yeah. especially with the body and trauma. And our body mm-hmm. and trauma is so, we don't think about it because we always think cognitively, right? We're always thinking with our right. brain. We don't think our body can really talk to us and can. So now when you're working with somebody that's gone through trauma, yourself included, like what are some of the practices or some of the things that you, I want to talk about all three, the anxiety, the depression, and the trauma. What are some of the things that you would um, say to somebody who's, who's been through surgery, their body has trauma. What would you say to them to maybe to do, to help, to to kind of shift the energy. I mean, I do a lot of psychoeducation over what is trauma, kind of laying the groundwork um, or normalizing. Like sometimes it just helps for patients to uh, hear or read stories about other people who've been through it so that they, they can have language of like, yes, this clicks, there's something in my being resonates with this. And then helping them find ways to find safety in their body again because it's myself included it's much easier to disassociate and if you if you do it you'll know I know and I'm I've learned like in order to survive really painful terrible things I do it pretty frequently throughout my day still but especially if there's a medical appointment coming up, if I have to walk in through the same hospital doors or there's beeping or the same smells. So it's learning a lot of like having a lot of compassion for that part of my brain. That's just like, I need to do Like, I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, so what are ways that I, so I always have like a fidget or some sort of like sensory thing mm-hmm. in my hand. Um, but like, what are calming ways that I can work with that um, fluttery feeling that, or that overwhelm, that panic, um, kind of like helping patients craft almost like a safety plan. Um, it's for like, so the next time, which I will have a flare at some point, or I will need to go in for a blood draw, how, what are the pieces I can control? And then what can I not? So like, maybe I choose um, to bring someone with me. Maybe I have on my favorite outfit that has on Crohn's awareness or ostomy. You could, can I have music on? Do I want to be touched? Do I not want to be touched? Do I want to have a stress ball? Like trying some very real kind of sensory supports as they go through it. Um, the breath, the breath is like, the undersold, underused tool that's with us wherever we go. And it's like insane the amount of benefit it can give us as GI patients for uh, the brain gut connection and massage it. Like when we take those diaphragmatic breaths, it like massages our organs, it stimulates our vagus nerve, which calms us. Like there's so many benefits. So I really try and spend time. Um, selling it, but just explaining why it's so important. It's not just do some belly breaths and it'll cure your Crohn. No, 
this is just a tool that if you can use it preventatively and also when you're in fight or flight, it is revolutionary. I mean, I also encourage people to do some sort of like joyful movement to get in their body. So, um, you know, some people like you are like hardcore weightlifting, you know, like competitive. Um, some people want to do just like really gentle restorative yoga. Uh, the pool can be amazing if you have joint pain and it just, there's something about the buoyancy that just kind of helps people get in their body. Um, dance, you know, kind of Reiki, like just very gentle massage can be a huge healing. Again, it's trying to think of things outside the just talk therapy box. Mm -hmm. um, talking does help, but um, sometimes I'll refer people out to like a somatic therapist or someone who specializes in EMDR because that's, you know, a targeted intervention with a lot of research to kind of re reprocess some of those memories. Um, and integrate them. So there's a lot of ways. I think I, I usually try and just start with the education of like, your body is so wise. Like it is our, everyone's body is just trying to keep us alive and protect us. Um, and one, one of the keys that I love, I'm trying to remember who maybe Hillary McBride says to use your pronouns for your body. So instead of saying it, like my body, it feels bad, it feels fluttery. Um, I go by she, her. So I say like, she is, what does she need right now? Like, what does she want for this upcoming appointment? She, is she hungry? Special. Is she tired? Yeah. It's like really, it's like a really subtle, but yet profound shift of like, we, it's, it's not, it isn't something I'm, it is me. What does she need? Almost treating it like a little girl. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with parts work of like family systems. So like, what does that little scared girl with Crohn's who was diagnosed when she was 18, what does she need to hear? Like, what would she say? You know, so really kind of like connecting into that, like vulnerable piece and not running from it and just saying like, okay, what does she need today? Can I give that to her? I'm an adult. I'm going to make priority to make sure she gets that. I'm that's my job. Like, but I can choose also not to tune into her, which is a lot easier, but it has effects, you know? So it's, it does. it's kind of, kind of um, easier said than done. It's just kind of holding space for people to have resistance to it. I'm just saying, I don't want to think about that. I don't like tuning into my body. It's uncomfortable. And then I want to dissociate. Okay. But there's no judgment. There's again, it's all survival. It's okay. We can work with your ambivalence. We'll, we'll just try and explore what what was that resistance doing for you? Obviously, you're afraid that if you tune in, it might feel really blank. Let's let's just talk about it from you know a non judgmental space. So and it's beautiful. I love the work. It's just it feels like it's I'm on the journey too. I mean, I I would believe anyone as a human trying to love their bodies in the society we live in anyone's on the journey, but the chronic illness body is extra hard to love sometimes, especially in the flares, especially in uncomfortable physical sensations. So it's just like, yeah, we're all just walking each other home, trying to figure it out, trying to reconnect ourselves, join, join the club. It's messy. Now, would you say the same thing? And you, I mean, you said so much like, so for the trauma in the body, it was, it was a lot of movement, whatever it was, yeah. it was movement. It was the dance. movement and like sensory. And yeah. Sensory, yeah. So like right? some sort of like, do I want to put my hand on my heart while I breathe or my head or my stomach or wherever it's pain? Do I want a heating pad behind me? Do I want ice? Do I want something crunchy? Do I want to push against a wall? Cause I have a lot of feelings. Or do I want like a nice weighted blanket and it feels, you know, so trying to give patients, like I have this big long list of all these different options. And so we kind of go through them of like, make your go-to, like your top 10 things that help you ground, help you feel like yourself, give you joy. But I always encourage it. Don't pick any of the ones that you can't do on a bad day. Like if you had literally zero spoons walking around the block, I mean, great. That's great. Or like a nice, like a hardcore weight workout. Awesome. 
those we don't list on our go-tos. You'll, you'll have the energy to think of that, but like, these have to be like bed bound activities. Like the restorative you know? yoga, which is literally just yes. putting your body into a, you know, crossing your yeah. left leg over your left and just yes. twisting a little bit and sitting there. For Staying in like a minutes. gentle stretch. Yeah. Easy, yeah. Easy, easy Keeping stuff. yourself over a pillow, like yep. laying on your stomach, feeling the diaphragmatic breathing, like can massage everything again, super gentle. Yep. Um, so Breath starting like really said. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. There's so many, there's like Google, there's so many different four, seven, eight breathing box breathing. Like there's ones that I do with, for kids. Um, there's, I mean, it's really, you can kind of collect them like playing cards of like, Oh, well it didn't work this time. Or I'm hyperventilating as I'm getting this blood drawn. She didn't get me on the first day. Okay. Well, let's try something out. Okay. I'm going to put the music in. Or I'm going to put like you know, like a guided visualization of help. I'm going to go to the beach today. So I do a lot of like gut directed hypnotherapy too with GI clients. And it's especially great for um, disorders of the gut brain interaction. So like IBS, things like that, but it's been shown to help IBD patients too with staying in remission. So just knowing you kind of have to build up your toolbox and think outside the box too. It's so important. And I, and it's probably not too different for people who are suffering from depression or anxiety too, right? Yeah. It's pretty yeah. much, here's all the different things you can try, put some on, yeah. see how they fit, see how they feel. Maybe they work one time, maybe yeah. they don't. Uh, maybe they'll work a different time or maybe there's something else that you enjoy. And I think yeah. it's, like you said, it's the stuff, not just when you have the energy, but it's the stuff you can t- continuously do every day. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's that meditation, the meditation, putting yourself into sure. it, learning how to meditate, right. Learning yep. how to breathe, um, right. you know, doing all those things just so it's just so important. It's, it's such yeah. important work yeah. and it's a big part of the things that we don't really think about, right? We think surgery is right. over, I'm in a bag, mm-hmm. I'm just going to deal right. with it, I'm going to go to work tomorrow, yeah. I'm going to raise my kids and then life is just going to go on. Mm-hmm. We don't ever sit back and say, hey, wait a minute, I might need to take some self-care time. I might need yeah. a few minutes in the morning or I might need a few right. minutes before I go to bed or in the middle of the day or, oh my gosh, I'm yeah. all feeling anxious why am I feeling anxious? Let me take a minute mm-hmm. and explore that. And that, yeah, a lot of women, we're very intuitive. And a lot of us mm-hmm. will go into that direction of, okay, you know, we, this is what I, we're learning. We can't be at all, right? Because it's what we mm-hmm. try to do. We can't be at yep. all. But where there's a lot more women that are coming into this, like, you know what? No, I need a second and taking care of ourselves. And that's the self-care piece. It's not going and getting your nails done, yep. your hair done, all that stuff. Right, but right. And too, Men need to be doing this too, because men, right. masculinity, that they're strong, they're powerful, they can take on the world. They have to, I mean, they can, mm-hmm. if they want to, but they have this whole right. mentality. Of, I have to be this person. Mm-hmm. I don't have a moment to have any of this. Yeah. And I think that stuff hurts them more. So I think right. them incorporating some of these strategies can absolutely mm-hmm. help them. Right, right. We have a long way to go with men's mental health. I see a lot of men and I, I hear that echoed of like, I don't, I don't have anyone else I can talk to about this besides if I have a partner, but I have no other male friends that are willing to like go deeper like this, or like, kind of like be a safe place to explore. And just knowing like, this is, this is our humanity. This isn't gendered. So I don't care what, where you lie with gender identity. Like we all have to be checking in with ourselves. I mean, you, you don't have to, you could go throughout your life, never, never taking care of yourself, but like at what cost, mm-hmm. I think as chronic illness patients, we learn like, I'm going to pay for this more than my peers might, my healthy peers. And so I do want to invest time. I would rather be preventative than reactive. So maybe I do need a little morning routine. Maybe I do need to spend extra time cooking down my veggies so I don't get a blockage. Maybe I do need to like, I don't know, have some sort of movement so that things get going in my digestive tract. Like just knowing it's okay to, but, but yeah, I think there's more of a stigma 
especially in different cultures, I would say there's definitely a varied degree of stigma around mental health and GI, and then also the within genders. Um, one thing I like to give a shout out to is this organization called the Rome Foundation I'm a part of. Okay. So it's all the GI mental health providers. We do trainings through them and it's a global organization. Um, and they have a directory of professionals. So everyone there is trained to work with patients with GI conditions. I realize not all ostomates, some are bladder mm -hmm. um, conditions, but there's a strong health psychology component and it's phenomenal. So you can go on their website. It's called romegipsych.org. And it's kind of like UOAA or like the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. It's just as like a place for everyone to gather. And then if you were needing to find somebody who's licensed wherever you live, like if you're like, hey, I kind of want to get some support. I think I might have some of this PTSD stuff or whatever. Just knowing that it's, um, it's a new and growing field. There's not enough therapists to go around, which is a bummer. Um, but we're working on it and we're trying to train up more people and it's something that's really, really common for GI disorders because a lot of the, um, inflammation in our gut affects our brain. Uh -huh. And so knowing that, you know, dopamine and serotonin, they're made in our gut. And guess what? If I have a bunch of my gut removed or inflamed, like there's going to be some very real brain chemistry deficits so i like to also tell people like you're not destined if you have an ostomy or a gi condition to have some anxiety or depression but you're a much higher risk kind of like the BRCA gene like mm -hmm. you need to be looking for it and kind of trying to mitigate it with some sort of self-care with some sort of I mean, some people do therapy, some people do medication, some people just try healthy habits. Um, just knowing that it's an option that's out there. A lot of, a lot of um, teaching hospitals are starting to kind of embed mental health into the GI health, which is, that's, that's the gold standard. To be like, I could see my surgeon, but also the dietitian that just knows ostomies and GI and then the mental health provider and then the wound ostomy nurse, like that's how that's amazing what we want for everyone. Be? I know that's like what I want for everyone. That's like when I tasted that as a patient, I was like, I basically told my provider cause I was not in the field yet. I was a, a teacher and I was like, I want what you have. Like, I want your job. Like you just get to meet with GI patients all day. This is fun. This is so cool. I didn't even know this was a thing. I'm so glad someone, my doctor mentioned it to me. And so through that, I mean, cause it, you feel so much more supported, mm -hmm. you know, like you can, that's what I want for everyone in the world. If you have to go through one of these terrible illnesses or a surgery that is life altering, you should have that built in. Yeah. Um, that is the whole person approach. And that's kind of, I always like to say, if you don't have that, bug your doctor and be like, hire someone, get a more integrated team. Look at me as a whole person. And if they won't hire them, there's probably someone like me in private practice that you can see too. If they, you know, yeah. and just piece it together until they get with it, but <laughs> until they get the wave, the wave of the future. Come on, doctors. We right. need it. We need it to is, put money. It's that whole holistic. It's the whole holistic human being, right? It's, and it's, mm -hmm. it's like some of these doctors, I'm my, my PCP now out of New York. Um, I don't see her enough because I just, you know, I'm like, I just don't, right. I see her once a year yeah, for yeah. physical or whatever, which is good. Knock on wood. Right. I see my specialist more than her. But then she was like, well, I'm going into this different practice where you need to pay me two grand a year just for mm. me to see you because I want to see less patients so that I can spend more time with my patients. I know. So I that, know, that like way she concierge. all that stuff. So she's doing the whole concierge thing, which is becoming huge in practice huge. now. I mean, mind you, she was that much because she was in, she was in sure. Tribeca. <laughs> she yeah. was in Rwanda. Yeah. There was that. But there's a lot of doctors that are starting to do that because one, they don't make a lot of money. I know people think Great. doctors make a lot of money. They don't, right? The insurance right. companies and the insurance companies basically yeah. control how much they make. However, right. so they need to do these things. And I think that by them doing concierge, 
we're going to be able to find more doctors that are going to actually start putting that together. Like you're saying, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but I love that you said, so, so, um, Rome GI psych. Yeah. Rome is like the city of Rome in Italy, R O M E G I. And then psych is like psychology P S Y C H dot org. P S Y H I should have spelled that out. That's a, no, that's totally fine. So what I'm going to do is I, um, for all you guys listening to, I will definitely put the link to this, to that in the show notes as well. So that you can, if you know you need some help, you know that you're going through some things or you want to even explore, like maybe this is trauma, maybe my body is in trauma, maybe I do need a little more help in certain areas, you get at least to have a place to go to actually explore and try and find somebody yeah. in your area that can help you with that stuff. Um, Stephanie, you have been amazing. Your story is phenomenal. Oh. But just all the help that you have said, all the advice that you have just given everybody, especially when it comes to mental health, because this is mental health is everything, right? It, it is our gut is. And, our mind, and the more stuff that they're yeah. learning about it, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being in the holistic world, wellness world myself, it's like the whole, your gut has to be healthy. And if we don't have a gut, what do we have? Right. So right. how do we make it all work? Um, if you were to leave the listeners and I always ask everybody this, if you were to leave them with one thing, what would that one thing be? Mm. I would say, I know this sounds ironic, but I would say, trust your gut. <laughs> Many of us have very medically altered guts, but trust. I also call it like your intuition or your knowing, trust your knowing. First, you have to slow down enough to tune in and check in with yourself, like even thinking like, would I need support, mental health support, even though I'm so far past surgery, or do I want to work on that? Or um, just tuning into your body, like all of that requires slowing down and then trusting that like, you are the only one who has to live in this body and trust that it's enough. Speak up, advocate say something to your doctors, um, say something to your loved ones. But I think sometimes we, you know, out of survival, we minimize and don't trust or, you know, we get brushed aside by a provider. They don't have enough time. So I just say, trust your knowing, speak up. I love that. Advocate for yourself. Just listen to your gut. Listen mm -hmm. to it tells you your body will tell you it does it does it's a wise day. wise body it's crazy yeah yeah she knows things that you don't know so you need to listen to her and see what does she have to say to you today Is there exactly. something she needs yeah exactly exactly well stephanie thank you again so much for being here with us this week i truly truly appreciate having you oh, on the show you're welcome thanks for having me it's so lovely and thank you for the work you do at the beautiful bag and all the cool guests you have and the awareness you I mean, there's so much good stuff here. So I love that I can refer people to your podcast as another kind of source of support. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that a ton. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us this week. If you enjoyed this podcast, get the behind the scenes at leannehayden.com slash ostomy updates. And also, if you found this episode encouraging, please screenshot it and share it on Instagram. And don't forget to tag me and also the person who was on the episode with me. I occasionally will do special gifts for anyone who does do a screenshot and share it on Instagram or in your stories. Also, lastly, please go to Apple or Google, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast to keep up with them every single week. I enjoy you guys. Thank you so much for being here.